Hey everyone, it's Robin R. Silent Crafts and welcome to my studio. I have another quick gift project for you guys. We've been doing a lot of kitchen items lately, so let's do one more. We've made bowl cozies. Now we're going to make an ice cream cozy. I don't have any ice cream in the house right now. But I do love these Talenti containers. It's still a one pint container, so whether you use the cardboard ones or these nice, fun, reusable plastic ones, it's going to fit into the project that I'm gonna show you today. I love that these cozies, just like our bowl cozies, are reversible. If you've made bowl cozies as gifts, like many of us have, by now you realize that people request them more and more of them, they love it as a gift, so why not make them a combo gift? and make them a bowl cozy for their soup or other items. Or maybe they want a bowl of ice cream because they buy the bigger containers of ice cream. Or they can have the little pint size ice cream cozy. I have a feeling if you make one or two, you're gonna get requests for more. We're not gonna have a scrappy word for today, so what I'd love to know is down in the comments, let me know your favorite flavor of ice cream. I do love this peanut butter fudge, but I also love a good cheesecake ice cream. Maybe ice cream isn't your favorite dessert. Let me know what you do enjoy as an after dinner dessert or something special you have on the holidays. And don't forget to hit that like button if you love desserts and ice cream. Everything we need is going to be a 10 inch square. You need two cotton fabrics, one for the outside, one for the lining, and two pieces of cotton bag. So I'm going to use 100% cotton materials for everything, including the thread, both of the fabrics and both pieces of batting. We really don't know what the recipients of these gifts are gonna do, so I just like to err on the side of caution and make sure that it can also go in the microwave if they choose to. And I know some people like to put their ice cream in the microwave for a few seconds just to soften it up in case it's very difficult to get a spoon into. I set aside my cotton fabric for just one moment. We need to make some marks on our batting. To start with, I just want to make a diagonal X going from corner to corner. That is going to be our quilting line. It's just a simple two lines like we do with the soup bowl cozies, but if you'd like, this is a great time to practice a little of your free motion stitching, or if there's a certain design on quilting you'd like to try, like maybe feathers, or you just want to perfect your straight line quilting, you can quilt it more than just the X. But the X is going to hold everything together while we're working with it, and just give it that little bit extra of security that we need, but that's just your bare minimum. These are really great projects to practice different things on. Then afterwards, we want to draw a halfway line straight up this way and that way. So we have our two diagonal and we have a horizontal and a vertical. You can draw with just about any type of writing utensils you like. Things like this, I tend to stay away from the Sharpies, but if you have a fine point one and that's all you have, you can go ahead and use that. I just like to use my regular old basic Bic office pen. I find that that draws on the batting nicely and I just draw right down the center. And if I were using a marker, then I'd have to worry about it smearing. Now we need to make the marks for our darts and get our dart lines drawn. By using the darts, it allows it to go from this flat piece up into this one. Now we are using a wider and a deeper dart than we did with our regular bowl cozies, our soup bowl cozies, because we're using a taller container for our ice cream instead of a bowl for soup. Now this size might work also if you have a pint, maybe you have a styrofoam or some type of a cardboard container of soup. I have seen soups come like this, so you could also use it for that. On our horizontal and vertical lines, we want to mark three inches down on all of these lines. Just go around, put a little mark at three inches. And we want the top of our dart to be five inches wide. So I'm just gonna mark two and a half inches on either side. So if I take my little six and a half inch ruler here and I line it up two and a half inch mark on my line here, I can mark it at the beginning of the ruler and then at the five inch mark. That way I don't have to measure two and a half inches here and slide it over. Then we just play connect the dots. So I have my three inch mark down here and I'll bring it up to the two and a half inch there. Then 
Now, if all of these lines are just too confusing to you, you can use two separate colors of ink so that it's easier to see. Once you make one or two of these ice cream cozies, you'll get a really good feel for how it goes together and to see where maybe you can find your own little tips and tricks and shortcuts to make it easier for you. When I make the soup bowl cozies, I do have a template that I can just lay right down so I don't have to measure out my darts at all like that. I can just go ahead and lay it down and draw them in. Now that all of our lines are drawn, we can start putting everything together and I want to take one of my pieces of fabric, I'll put them right sides down so I'm looking at the back of it. I want to be able to see the writing, so I want to make sure when I put my batting down that I can see the writing. We're going to be sewing on the diagonal, so I'm going to put some pins in just to hold everything in place so nothing shifts while I'm doing the stitching. Same thing with our second piece, we have the right side down. If you have any wrinkles, now would be a good time to get them all pressed out before we start sewing. Cotton batting does tend to grip and hold on to everything, but as it's going through the machine, I still wanna make sure nothing's shifting. Now, if your machine has a walking foot, it might be a good idea to use that while you're stitching this diagonal line, just to make sure nothing moves around and shifts and does anything weird for you. But if you don't have a walking foot, you'll still be able to sew it really easily. Since we are going to be starting up here at a corner to stitch the diagonal, I like to have a little piece of scrap fabric. You can see I just have a bunch of threads on it. I let this go through my sewing machine first and then I feed this through and that usually helps to stop this from getting sucked down into the feed dogs. Now, if you're doing a leader ender project like Bonnie Hunter likes to do and many other people, you can go ahead and feed some of those blocks through. I'm gonna use a 2.0 stitch length and stitch down this one. And then once this one's done, I'm going to chain piece it and put this one in the sewing machine right after it. And then I'll disconnect this one and I'll stitch the other part of the X. So when we're done, we're going to have a stitched X on both of them. Or you can go ahead and quilt it in whatever way works for you. There's my X sewn in both pieces. If you're making a bunch of these for gifts and you want to do a bunch of production line of it, choose a neutral thread that will work for all of your little ice cream cozies or bowl cozies. That way you don't have to constantly change your thread every time you work on a bowl. Sometimes it's nice to have a contrast thread and maybe you want to have a dark thread on a light fabric or vice versa, or you can just use something of a neutral, a, a cream, tan, even a brown, you can use a white. I am using a silver and that just works nicely for both of these projects. Now here are our darts. So at this point, I take these two pieces, I bring the corners and I wanna pay attention to the fabrics and not the batting because sometimes the batting can, can shift. This doesn't have to be exactly perfect, but it is nice to at least try to match up those corners. I can put my finger in, make sure the fabric is laying flat in there put a little clip in. Now you can make sure that the line on this side matches the line on this side, or you can just say that once the corners meet, then everything else is going to be equal and meeting up anyways. Now this is one of the little shortcuts you can do is instead of drawing the entire thing, you can just draw it on half of it and know that you're always going to be sewing just on that line. So you don't need to worry about that line. I like to go ahead and put my clips on all four darts on each piece before I take it over to the sewing machine. Put my clips out of the way. You could put pins in it. This is a larger dart, so if you need a little extra help holding it together, if you put a pin right this way, it'll hold it. Otherwise, you can put a clip up here and one down there. Have them all clipped on both pieces. Take this over to the sewing machine and I'll keep the corner here lined up. And you can start stitching at either spot. I usually start here on the outside edge. I don't worry about back stitching here, but when I get into the center, I back stitch. When we stitch the inside and the outside pieces together, we'll stitch across this, which will hold that thread in place and lock it. But this is going to be on its own, so I like to back stitch there just to make sure it doesn't come undone at all. 
So if you're making multiple of these and you have them all prepped to this point, now you can go ahead and just chain piece them and you can just put them through the machine one after the other. Even though I'm only doing two, I still like the chain piece. I'll put this one through and then this one, cut my thread, move it over to the next section and just keep going until I have all eight of them sewn. But if you're making multiple for Christmas gifts, then it's a lot quicker if you can go ahead and chain piece and save a little bit of time in certain sections like right here by sewing all of them at once. So if you prep them all to each of the same stage, cut out all your fabrics, cut out your battings, mark your battings, quilt it, and then sew your darts. Now at this stage, it might look like you did something wrong, but it's just because we don't have that flat bottom. I always recommend making a test product first before you go ahead and make 20 of them as gifts or to put into your shop to sell. So when I made my first one, I got to this point and I tested it to make sure it was going to work. It wasn't gonna to be too big or too small. So my ice cream container fit in there nicely. Of course, I have the second one sewn the same way. Now I'm gonna trim off these darts. So here's my stitching line. Of course, it's silver, very hard to see. So when I trim this off, I'm going to leave a quarter inch, maybe a little bit smaller. We don't need to have a huge seam allowance here. We don't need to measure it. You can if you want. And then I'll just trim the four off of each part of the container. So there's four off the first cozy and then trim off the next ones. Now, if you've been here for a while, you know that I am not gonna throw away this piece of fabric. It is perfectly good. I'll save the fabric, but toss the batting. Doesn't matter which one you use, but we need to turn one of them right sides out. I wanna put this one inside of that one so that the right sides of the fabric are matching. And when I put it in, I wanna line up the points line up your points I put a clip in it you can put it on the side you can put it in the tip whatever works for you I just like to use this or of course you can use pins to hold everything in place so I don't have to worry about it when I get to the sewing machine I want to make sure everything stays where I need it to be and not shifting around because it's a lot easier to have extra pins or clips in it when we're at the sewing machine and we can just sew real quick, then they have to constantly stop and adjust it. But of course, you know your style and if you prefer only to put one or two pins in or none and just adjust it as you sew, go for it. You know it works for you. When I get to the little valleys, I'm gonna go ahead and clip those or pin them also. I'm gonna take my seam allowance and one side I'm gonna push to the right and the other side I'm gonna push to the left. In quilting, we call that nesting the seams. And what that does is it's going to line up the seam and I'm not super worried about nesting the seams specifically like in quilting, but I wanna take the extra bulk of the seam allowance and put one one way and one the other way because otherwise you're going to have all of that in one spot. And when we go to sew around this, it's going to be hard for our machines to get through it. Some machines don't like that much bulk and they won't sew through it. It doesn't really matter if you put them all going the same way. You can put them in different directions. All the outside can go to the right or they can go to the left or both, back and forth, whatever way it goes. Many times you'll hear people say, whichever way the fabric wants to go. Because sometimes I found that the last one that I do always seems to want to go in the opposite direction. So I'm not going to fight on it. Whatever way it naturally wants to go, oh, not the last one. Whichever way it wants to go, I'm gonna let it go that way. Because when it comes to sewing it and everything, it's not gonna really matter as long as they're split. We're going to stitch around using a, I like to use about a 3 8 to a half an inch seam allowance. And we're going to be stitching up and down the tips and down into the valleys all the way around here. But we need to leave an opening so that we can turn it. Some people I've seen make these, they leave an opening from here to here. 
about a three inch opening and other people just leave a little spot. Now on my first one that I made, I just left this little area and it's really hard to turn it. I've never left an opening with a dip down like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and see how that works this time to see if it's going to be easy once it gets turned around to match these seams back up and to get everything to work out okay. I'm sticking with the 2.0 stitch length and the reason I'm going for a larger seam allowance, it's going to make it easier to turn in this one section here if we have more fabric to turn under. If we just have a little quarter inch seam allowance, it's going to be hard to tuck the fabric in. But I'll show you how that's gonna look after I get it stitched. Now, if you're not sure how to put this into your sewing machine, don't worry, when we do the last step, I'll take you over to the sewing machine so you can see how I do it. And it's going to be the same for this step as that one. It's just in a different phase of the sewing. So I have this opening left here. I went ahead and I backstitched at the beginning and then backstitch at the end. So when we turn it the right side out, we are not going to have any issues with the threads popping and breaking. If the threads pop and break, you can either put it back underneath the sewing machine and stitch it, or you'll just have a larger opening to close up when we turn it right sides out. But before we turn it right sides out, we need to take out some of this excess seam allowance in certain areas. When we have these points here to get a decent corner, we need to go ahead and cut this out. I went ahead and used a little Sharpie just to mark where my stitching lines are so you can see them. I want to take this point off. I don't want to get too close to my stitching line, but it doesn't make sense to just trim off a little bit of it because you're still going to have all that bulk there. So I will take it and get a little bit close. Some people will go a little bit closer than that, but that's close enough for me. And I will do that on all of the points. If you accidentally cut through the stitching line in this very important section here, you can put it back underneath your sewing machine and restitch that area. Now on the points where it dips, just yeah. as if we were sewing with curves, I like to go ahead, I call it releasing the pressure. I like to take a little snip right here into that point. Again, staying away from the actual stitch line. Be careful because we are going through a lot of the seam allowances there. Scissors with a really sharp point to it that cut all the way up to the tip are really helpful. But you can see now, as I go to turn this, this is, it's, it's tight. It, there's no release to it at all. But this way, I can actually make this a straight line. It allows it to move and bend, but I still have the security of the stitching line. So I'm gonna do that on each section except for the one where the opening is. And I also want to trim down on some of the seam allowance because I did it at about a half an inch, three eighths to half an inch. I don't need to have all of this bulk because when I go to do my top stitching, there's going to be a lot of extra bulk in that area. Now the area that I left as my turning spot, I'm not going to trim anything here. I want that extra to tuck in. That's why we did the larger seam allowance. But on these other areas, I'm going to just trim this down a little bit, down to about a quarter of an inch. Sometimes I find it easier to go from the point down into the valley, but whatever works for you it just means that I turn mine around a bunch. Now we just reach in and we want to go between the two fabrics. Now since I have the larger hole, I don't have to worry about it, but if you're using a smaller hole, you can use the hemostats. The bigger the hole, the more you have to sew up afterwards. The smaller the hole, the harder it is to turn things right sides out. Sometimes we don't have a choice. If you've been here for a while, you know I like to use this rounded metal crochet hook. It's a size K. It has that nice rounded point without a sharp tip. That allows me to get in and poke out any of the areas, bring out my corners. And what I use it for is we have the points right here, so we need to bring those out. And if I use something too sharp, it could poke through and create a hole, which means I have to turn it back, wrong sides out, restitch that area. And that's another reason why I don't snip really close to the stitching line, so that I take less of a chance to pop it out. So I find if I put a finger on the inside and then my thumb, I can pop these corners out to start with. That one's really close to our opening. 
and it just keeps me from causing too much trouble when I go to pop the corners out with my crochet hook. It doesn't really matter at this point what is on the outside or the inside since it's reversible. I'm just going to match up the corners with my fingers and just put them that way. What I'm going to do is I want to take this over to the iron and I want to press these edges so that they're nice and as flat as you can get them because I'm going to be top stitching around here. That's going to keep this section together so when they go through the washer and stuff like that, it doesn't get a weird looking mess in this area. It really makes a big difference having that top stitching. And it's also going to close up the hole. Now if while you're making these you struggle with it because your sewing machine doesn't like to go through all of this bulk, because we trimmed down the seam allowance, I can feel right there where my seam allowance is. So I want to stitch just past that so that I'm not going through all those extra layers. But you can take this opening and just hand sew it closed so you don't have to do all that top stitching. Totally up to you. So I need to bring this down and take it over to my iron and give this a nice press. And the thing I have to worry about in this big opening now is making sure that I have this area match this area. So it might take a little fiddling to get it all situated, but I'll take it over and I'll give it a good press and see what I can come up with. As I mentioned earlier, the smaller hole makes it harder to turn, but easier to close it up. The bigger hole makes it easier to turn, but harder to close it up. So I've got everything best I can. It looks pretty even. As you can see, I have a whole bunch of pins to hold it in place. Everybody's had a nice press. I just laid it on the ironing board and I just put the tip of my iron in there just to press this area, not worrying about what's happening down below. So my top stitch, I will probably start somewhere over here before the hole just so I can get those pins out of the way. Make sure the fabrics are both laying down nice and flat. About an eighth of an inch away from the edge, up to a quarter of an inch. It all depends on how much fabric you have folded in here. I stick with my 2.0 stitch length, but if your machine is struggling with the thickness, you can go up to a 2.5. Anything after that, and you have to be careful. Now some machines you can go to a 3.0, and other machines like the Brother that I'm sewing on, the stitch length is just far too long for the top stitching. I'm going to follow it down to the valleys and back up to the peaks and go all the way around and when I get to the end I'll back stitch to secure the stitches. Biggest thing I want to pay attention to is to make sure I close this up and that I don't have any of the seam allowance just popping out. Sometimes you might have to go a little bit narrower here than your eighth of an inch, just a little smidge to make sure you have everything lined up well. Again, the larger seam allowance when we stitched around at the begin with allows me to tuck that in so I don't have to worry about too much popping out. If this was larger like the legs of pants or if you're making jammies for the kids or something, you could take whichever you happen to have here if your machine has the free arm, but this isn't really going to fit on there very easily. So we're gonna have to use a little different technique. Some people like to stitch on the inside and some people like to stitch on the outside. Whichever one works for you, I tend to stitch on the inside. So find your spot for your seam allowance. I'm holding on to the top thread, putting my needle down, bringing it back up, and that's gonna bring my bobbin thread up to the top. And that's gonna help me not have a big knot of thread or a mess on the back. Just move that, put my needle back down. So I can move this out of the way. You can take a back stitch here if you'd like. Some people do, some people don't, totally up to you. As I mentioned earlier, you find your own tips and tricks and what works for you. And I'm going to stitch up to the tip here and usually up to the stitching line that you can see. This is not a race, we don't have to go super fast. And when I get somewhere near the top where I'm gonna stop, I have my needle down. Many machines will automatically do the needle down when you stop sewing. Otherwise, you have to turn the little crank handle and put your needle down. This is gonna keep you in that spot. So when I lift my presser foot, I can pivot on that needle right there. 
and I don't have to worry about the position moving and trying to find where I was. Now this is the section that I'm coming to that has all of my pins in it. Again, I want to make sure that I'm going to catch all of that seam allowance so no, there's going to be no openings and I won't see any loose threads and any weird stuff happening. So I'll go really slow. And I want to remove the pins before I get to it because it's not good for you to stitch over a pin. Even though these are really thin, an accidental stitching over a pin is not like a crisis situation. If you hit it with your needle, you can break the tip of your needle off, which could come shooting at your face and get into your eye or poke you in the skin or something like that. So there is that danger of damaging your eye and your machine will make a really loud freaked out noise and it'll scare you. And it could cause some issues with your machine itself with the timing or other things. I'll just go slow. Remove my pin before I get to it. It might look upon close inspection that I am going over the pin, but I'm letting it get almost up to the needle before I pull it out. So that way it's holding everything in place and nothing's gonna shift at the last minute. I hope you're able to see everything. does mean that sometimes I'll bend my pins, but that's all right. When I get to the seam, I'll go ahead and pivot there. Once I know that the hole is closed up from where I turned it, then I feel a little bit more comfortable that I can go a little bit faster, but I'm still not gonna go my speed deeming way. Very few people, if any, are gonna measure and say that your top stitching here was an eighth of an inch and your top stitching over in another area was a little bit wider. I do tend to make it a little bit narrower where the turning is, and then as I get going around other areas, I do make it a little bit wider. And when I turn, I just make sure the point of area that I'm working on from my needle to the next point or to the little valley is nice and smooth. And I just, I don't worry about the rest of it because I'm not sewing in that area. When I get back to the beginning, I'll go a couple stitches over it and backstitch it and then it'll be done. Trim your threads even with your project. Since the circumference around here is smaller, even though we started with the same size squares, our bowl cozies, our darts made it much smaller. It makes it a little bit harder, a little bit more fiddly to get it through the machine. Take it over and give it a nice good press, at least in these areas. If you have one of the little small handheld irons, you can go ahead and put that in and get that all nice. If you have some of these special tools for when you're sewing clothes, you can put that in there and that will allow it to give it a nice good steam press all the way around and have everything look good. But if you're going to be wrapping this up and putting it in a package, is it going to really matter? You're going to be folding it anyways. Put your ice cream in. And it's gonna keep your hands from getting cold possibly even from getting the ice cream on it because it will get onto your holder. And of course, these are hand washable, machine washable. Make a bunch of them for everyone in the family so that they can just go into the washing machine. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you make a bunch of these ice cream cozies for your friends and families as gifts. If you wanna see a quick video on what I do with these scraps, the first link down below in the description box is for a notification newsletter. Every time I put a video up here on YouTube, you'll get an email that notifies you that, hey, RS Island Cross Robin put a new video up on YouTube. Go check it out. If you're looking for some more fun, check out the video here or there. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and click on my little pink flamingo and subscribe to my channel. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.